I'm going to turn the toast to you, Mark. No, <laughs> Uh, that's you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Shall we do this? It's only one person. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, welcome everyone uh, to today's um, RTS seminar. Uh, we are very happy to welcome Rutura, uh, my uh, former um, postdoc supervisor and. Uh, I would say a friend of mine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I and, so. And so, yeah, there's much to say about uh, his career because it's a very long career, right? So she, she did uh, her PhD right here at the University of Zurich and then uh, went to uh, Cambridge in, in the UK, where uh, her first postdoc went to Princeton in the US, came back to uh, Zurich uh, for an assistant professorship, and then um, moved uh, for a full professorship uh, to the University of Geneva. Um, uh, in Geneva, uh, she uh, built up a uh, quite visible uh, um, cosmology group. Uh, I think it's one of the great places um, in Europe where you can do cosmology, and I was very happy to be uh, one of the group members at some point. Uh, all these things uh, I have learned from not all, but many <laughs> things I have, <laughs> uh, I have learned from Ruth. And um, yeah. So I think she has done a lot uh, in most cosmology in, in the Swiss community. And uh, maybe you remember that last year, um, our institute, uh, with support from the British Swiss department, uh, had proposed her for the honorary doctorate, and she was awarded uh, the honorary doctorate from the University of Zurich uh, last year. So yeah, with all this introduction, now she's going to uh, talk um, about uh, probably one of the topics uh, that she's um, very interested in. From a year session to relativity with cosmological large scale structure observations. Thank you, Julian, for the kind invitation. So, the topic of my talk is the question whether we can or cannot test general relativity with cosmology, and actually, more specifically, with cosmological uh, large scale structure observations. And the answer will, of course, be to some to some extent we can do this. I just now on the way here realized that I'm not talking to a cosmology audience, but to a much broader audience that there are people here who are doing planetary studies and uh, machine learning and uh, uh, sensor systems for satellites or God knows what. So. Please, if I talk over your heads, speak up, interrupt me, and ask uh, details, more details or more explanations, no problem. We are not so many that this could be done. So the outline of my talk is first a generic introduction, and then I will talk a bit about very large-scale galaxy surveys, which are underway and coming, and I will uh, especially talk about the angular power spectrum and the correlation function of galaxy number counts and what we can learn from them. I will uh, make a couple of examples, mainly three examples. One, how can we measure the so-called lensing potential? I hope I can explain a little bit what that is with large-scale structure surveys. Then I will introduce the so-called EG statistics, which is probably a good test of general relativity, which we may perform with these large galaxy surveys. And then I'll talk about how we can measure the growth rate of perturbations with, with these surveys, which is also going to be a test of general relativity. As you all know, Einstein's theory of gravity has been tested in many ways and passed all the tests with flying colors. We have measured light deflection, uh, the perihelium, uh, perihel perihelium advance of Mercury was known before general relativity was developed and was Einstein's first great success. Since then, many other binary systems with large perihelion advance of 
degrees per year and not just 40 arc seconds per century have been discovered and uh, measured. Shapiro time delay has been measured in our solar system and, 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 and uh, in the last six, seven years, we are also measuring routinely gravitational waves from binary systems. So you might ask, what do they still want to test general relativity? We know it's correct, but there are two caveats to this. One is all these observations essentially test the vacuum solution of Einstein's equation and not the solutions with an energy momentum tensor. This is one caveat. The other one is all these tests are on scales roughly of the order the solar system or smaller. So not, and with cosmology, we would test the equations on much larger scales. And the question is, can we test these equations with a non-vanishing right-hand side with an energy momentum tensor, which is non-zero? <clears throat> uh, in cosmology, we have the probably most relevant solution of Einstein's equation or, or, or case of Einstein's equation with an energy momentum tensor. This row here is the energy density. Lambda is a cosmological constant, which may be there, or vacuum energy, which has the same effect. So the cosmological solution is a very simple solution based on the assumption that uh, space, uh, space is homogeneous and isotropic. If that's the case, the entire dynamics of space-time is encoded in a so-called scale factor and its rate of expansion or contraction is given by the so-called Hubble parameter. And then there is its acceleration or deceleration, which is uh, determined by the second derivative of the scale factor. Have we tested these equations with cosmological observations? What have we really done in cosmology? What did we truly observe about this space-time. Uh, we have measured the flux for uh, objects which, are, which have more or less a known luminosity, intrinsic luminosity. We have measured their flux as a function of the redshift of how far away they are from us. So this cosmological expansion leads to a redshift which we can routinely measure by looking at some spectral lines or so. It's easy to measure the redshift in cosmology. And we have measured the flux as a function of redshift. Uh, and if we know the luminosity, the intrinsic luminosity of a source, this tells us how far away the source is. This gives us the so-called luminosity distance, which in such a universe can also be easily calculated. And this is a simple function of the redshift and the Hubble parameter. Where this high key is given by this expression here, the curvature enters, the spatial curvature K. So that's, so this is the quantity we have measured and so we have inferred the distance. And that's what we have found. Here is a slightly outdated plot of here in the vertical scale, you see, uh, something which is proportional to the log of the distance, this uh, called distance modulus, uh, the, the apparent magnitude minus intrinsic magnitude. But what is plotted is not that, but it's the difference of this uh, log of the distance or proportional with some uh, strange factor having historical reasons. Uh, of the distance divided by the, the one of a Milne universe. A Milne universe is a strange part of Minkowski space where you have a universe where you only have curvature, but no matter, no cosmological constant, nothing. So it's just actually part of Minkowski space described in a slightly weird manner. And this is here the curve zero. So you see the observations are not compatible, for example, with such a Milne universe, but they are also not compatible with a universe containing only matter, be it flat, that's this line, open, which means negative curvature, or closed, which means positive curvature. 
but they are compatible with a strange mix of a cosmological constant, which contributes 70% to the Hubble parameter here is, uh, and, and matter, which contributes 30% to the Hubble parameter and no curvature. Here, these, these uh, black uh, um, dots with error bars are from supernovae, where we assume we know or we can correct for a kind of uh, 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 fixed intrinsic luminosity. And so we can measure this distance. And the red dots are from BAOs, baryon acoustic oscillations, where we actually know the extent, the, so uh, which, where we do not measure uh, luminosity distance, but we measure uh, angular diameter distance, but there is a simple relation between the two, which is used here in this plot. These are these three red points. This is a slightly outdated compilation from 2017. So now we have, uh, yeah, but the, 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 the more important question is, have we so, so have we measured omega lambda and omega matter? And the answer is, of course, no, we have not. We have assumed that Einstein's equations are correct. And if they are correct, we need to have this value for omega matter and this value for omega lambda. So we have assumed the Einstein equations and then we conclude this. We do not measure the presence of matter and lambda directly. What we have measured in many different ways is the, is the presence of uh, radiation, so photons in the universe and ordinary matter in the universe, but they give us an omega ordinary matter and radiation or so of a few percent. They are much too small to explain these numbers. So if we say, okay, we know that there is only about 4% ordinary matter and radiation, and there is nothing else, then we would have to conclude Einstein's equation don't hold. But so far, we haven't done the, this. We have said, okay, there is dark matter, 30%, and there is a cosmological co constant which makes up 70%. Is there a question? There's one data point, isn't there? I'd say it doesn't matter. No, question was, is that just one data point or is it maybe? You mean the CMB? It's one data point, really. I mean, it's a bit more complicated because of lensing, right? Because we also have information from lensing, which is not negligible. But there is one data point with a very, very tiny error bar. Yes. That's right, which is not on this plot. <clears throat> so... Uh, of course, today we have uh, about double as many supernovae. That's a, a more recent uh, compilation, but the plot is, doesn't show that nicely what I wanted to show. And the conclusion from this double as many uh, data is the same as the one uh, from the previous plot. So in this talk, I shall show that when we use clustering observation, we can actually go further. Clustering observation, meaning that we, we know that the universe is not perfectly homogeneous and isotropic. And if we take that into account, we can actually do more and we can, to some extent, uh, measure both sides of the Einstein equations. That's what I want to explain in this talk, that we can do this. And I will be quite simplistic and only look at the two-point correlation function or its Fourier transform the power spectrum to some extent. Uh, this two-point correlation function is the probability above the mean or below the mean to have a galaxy at position Q if I know there is one in position P. And if I have a homogeneous and isotropic process which generates this fluctuation, then this function is only a function of the distance between the two points. And if that's the case, then uh, its Fourier transform is given by a so-called power spectrum. And we have some kind of momentum conservation, which is a consequence of spatial homogeneity, like usually. 
there was already a question about the CMB. Uh, most of you probably have seen these pictures. It was even in the New York Times, uh, which is the, the sky the scene, uh, uh, seen, seen by Planck, which is the cosmic microwave background, small fluctuations in the radiation coming from the universe, having been freed at the moment where protons and electrons combined to neutral hydrogen and the universe became transparent to this radiation. The CMB is the cosmological success story. Most of what we know about our universe, we know from looking at this data. Here you see the, the, the power spectrum of the Planck data. Now this, the sky is a function on the sphere. So if we, it's, it, if we want to analyze it, we expand it in spherical harmonics. And if we have statistical isotropy, only uh, um, Diagonal ALMs here in this expansion are correlated and they, they generate the so-called uh, power spectrum of the CMB, which is plotted here. And you see the blue curve is a curve which contains like six parameters describing the universe and they very, very well describe all this data. So there is something which is right about this. Now the question is, can we repeat this success with the galaxy distribution, or at least partially? In principle, in the, uh, the galaxy distribution is a three-dimensional uh, sample, while the CMB is, is essentially two-dimensional from the surface of last scattering. So there would be more information in this data. How can we use it? It's, of course, also more complicated. So far, what people have done mainly is they have looked at the power spectrum of density fluctuations, and they have seen in this power spectrum these oscillations, which are the same oscillations as the ones which you have seen in the CMB, these acoustic peaks. They are very similar. It's, they stem from the same physics. Uh, they are much smaller because this power spectrum is dominated by dark matter, which does not participate in these oscillations. It's not coupled to radiation. So they are very tiny, but they have been uh, detected with high significance. However, uh, there are several um, additional things which have, have to be taken into account and which I want to... Uh, which are which make the analysis more complicated, but also containing more information. First of all, we have to take into account if we look at large surveys that we are making observation on our past light cone. And speed of light is finite. I mean, whenever we look out, we see things in the past. If I look at the face here in the back of this room, this doesn't really matter. There is not much change going on between the nanoseconds uh, uh, the person was before the light from her face arrived in my eyes. However, if we look out in the universe, there can be a difference. It can be relevant. Furthermore, so we see density fluctuations which are further away from us, further in the past. And also we don't see three spatial dimensions. We see two spatial and one light-like dimension, or rather two angles and the redshift. That's what we measure. And the measured redshift is perturbed by peculiar velocities and by the gravitational potential. And not only the number of galaxies is uh, fluctuating, but also the volume is just distorted, especially if we measure it with redshift and angles. The angles we are looking into are not the ones in which light was emitted. Light is deflected by foreground structures and by the gravitational field on its way. And for small galaxy catalogs, these effects are not very important. But if we go to redshifts of order unity, they are they become relevant already for boss, this 
or especially also this year, I mean, right now, not yet. We have data until about redshift 0.5 from DESI, but soon we will have higher redshifts. And especially also, of course, for future surveys like Euclid. In a Friedman universe, the distance out to a given redshift is given by this integral, which depends on the content of matter, curvature, lambda or whatever you might have, which contributes to expansion to the expansion rate in the universe. So this the relation between distance and redshift always depends on the cosmological model. Um, but what is nice if you have redshifts much less than one, all the distances go like C over H naught if C is much less than one. So, and this uh, parameter dependence, we take it into account in cosmology by measuring all distances in, in units of H inverse megaparsecs. So this uh, uncertainty of the Hubble parameter is, is, has been uh, absorbed in our unit of length to get rid of it. However, already at redshift point one, the difference uh, from the from this expression or the, 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 the dependence on cosmological parameters is on the level of 10%. So if we are talking precision cosmology, already at redshift point one, we make 10% errors typically by having the wrong cosmology. So we cannot neglect the cosmology dependence because we want to, uh, at redshifts uh, larger than one, actually this series in redshift in, in powers of C doesn't even converge. So we really need to know the full information about the cosmological model. So one way around is to not do this, to not convert redshifts and angles into a length scale, but work with them. Then we don't uh, work directly with the observations and not make any assumptions about the underlying cosmology. Here you see an example of what happens if you, if you use the wrong cosmology, if you convert an angular correlation function into a radial correlation function. If you use the young, wrong cosmology, you stretch or compress it. Uh, and that's uh, that's what you do. But furthermore, if we look at, uh, uh, if we count galaxies inside a certain patch, then if we do this correctly, this has been pioneered by Jayul here and worked out in, in uh, slightly more detail later on also by uh, Gami, myself, and Jalinor and Louis. Uh, what we do measure for each galaxy we measure its position in the sky, so a direction n and the redshift. And we count galaxies inside a small redshift pin and a small solid angle. So this is the density of galaxies times the volume, which depends on, on, on the small redshift pin and the small solid angle. And we can measure the fluctuation of this count. <clears throat> And we can correlate it at different, uh, uh, in different directions and at different redshifts. This will be a function only of the angle between the two different directions because we assume statistical isotropy, but it will depend on the two redshifts. And this quantity is directly measurable. This delta is in principle directly measurable and so is its correlation function. And, the, uh, and it can be expressed in, in these kind of terms where the first term is a bias factor times the density fluctuation in uh, co-moving gauge, in co-moving coordinates. This term here is the so-called redshift space distortion, which is no, known also under the name Kaiser effect because it was, it was uh, worked out first by Nick Kaiser in the 80s. And it's due to the radial volume distortion because we measure galaxies in redshift. And this is a so-called lensing convergence. It is due to the fact that, uh, that we have lensing. So it has actually two effects here. 
this uh, this factor two and then this factor minus five s. The factor two just comes from the fact that if there is convergence, we see galaxies from further uh, from a larger angular patch than they actually are, and so we underestimate their density. On the other hand, we typically have a telescope which has a finite uh, flux limit. And we'll only see galaxies which shine above a certain flux limit. And therefore, uh, lensing can actually increase the flux which comes into our telescope from a given galaxy. And uh, so this gives an increase in the number of galaxies. So galaxies which we wouldn't see if there wouldn't be lensing, we see them due to lensing. And this term is proportional to this factor 5s which is more or less the logarithmic derivative of the number density of galaxies at the flux limit of your, of your telescope. So this is a survey dependent quantity which one has to measure for a given survey. The, there are other effects which are very small and are called large scale relativistic effects. Let me not specify them in detail because they are really small. Here you see uh, redshift space distortions, which have been measured very exquisitely, for example, in the BOSS survey. And this kind of squashing here is what is described by linear perturbation theory, which is the following effect. If you have, let's say, a cluster somewhere and you have galaxies in front of it, they fall into that cluster. So you assign, they have a slightly bigger redshift than the cosmological one. And if you convert the cosmological redshift uh, the redshift which you see into a cosmological distance, you assume that they are further away. For those behind, it's the opposite direction. You assume they are closer, and so you squash something which would be intrinsically more roundish. That is this large-scale squashing. These small kind of fingers of God are nonlinear effects coming from virialized structures which move like crazy in all directions, and so you see the radial spread in redshift. These are just two pictures at different mean redshifts. <clears throat> so if we now have this fluctuation, this number count fluctuation, it's a function on the sphere again and on the redshift. That's what we measure, directions and redshifts. So let's stay with this, measured quantities, expand it in spherical harmonics as we did for the CMB, and then we get a correlation function which depends on the angle of separation and on two redshifts. And here is a linear uh, perturbation theory calculation of this at very, very low redshift in a small redshift pin. And you see the red line is the density part only, and you see it's completely dominated by the density. So it wasn't a big deal to neglect the other contributions to it. They are small. However, let's take another extreme. Again, linear perturbation theory, where we go at redshift three and make and consider a, a relatively large redshift window. Then you see the term which dominates is actually one which has always been neglected in the past, which is the, uh, the lensing term. So if you don't take that into account, you will find all kinds of deviations from general relativity. And so this is a very, very important that high redshift. What is the angular scale that's being assumed here? Here, you see, I'm looking at L. So L equals 100. I'm, go I'm only showing the low Ls. L equals 100 corresponds to pi divided by 100, so roughly a degree angular scale. Here you see the result from n-body simulations, where we also calculated these number counts, actually with, with uh, Francesco and, and Julian here. And uh, again, we have a relatively low redshift part where uh, redshift space distortions are relevant, but at least on large scales, because the, 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 the redshift window here called sigma z is also considerable. 
So the redshift space distortions are only relevant on uh, relatively large scales. And if we go to high redshifts here, redshift three, again, a lensing term is becomes relevant. The, the, the difference between the class Halofit and our simulation is not to be taken uh, as at face value at L equals a thousand, because at L equals a thousand here, shot noise enters and, and uh, generates this upturn. You, we can also look at the radial correlation function correlating, uh, let's say, some L equals 20 in this case, which corresponds to pi over 20, which is what, about uh, five, six degrees so, uh, scale, angular scale, with a redshift 0 0.1, 0 0.5, etc., with higher redshifts. The thing which you mainly see here, the so-called standard terms, which is density and redshift space distortions, are in blue. And there you see the characteristic um, uh, sign change of the correlation function. The other important term, relevant term, is just the lensing, which is again in magenta. And you see that at high redshift, this lensing term is very important. At very low redshift, it is not so important. Okay, so what can we learn from this? For example, what we also find, if we have well-separated redshift bins, then the main thing which correlates uh, um, number counts in a redshift bin, one behind the other one, is that the foreground one lenses generate, acts as a lens. The foreground density acts as a lens for the background. So if we, if we look at... Uh, the correlation at different redshifts, the main, uh, the main term is the lensing term. Here you see from a, uh, from a calculation where we look, uh, the uh, compare the full result with the local result only and the lens uh, lo local lensing correlation. If we, if we look at the bin one correlated with itself, we see that only the local term is relevant. However, if we correlate bin one with bin four, then the lensing term already becomes significant and the black line no longer agrees with only the local term. If we correlate bin one with bin 10, then the local term is completely zero and it's only the, cross, uh, the lensing term which leads to cross correlation, which is relevant. We can use this to measure the lensing term now well, let me show this graph. It contains less information, but it's easier to go through. So in a Fisher matrix analysis, we said, okay, let's multiply this len the lensing term with a factor beta and see how well we can actually measure this beta. And as you see, interestingly, beta can be measured very well if we consider also cross correlations. That's the solid lines. The dashed lines only consider autocorrelations, while the solid lines consider autocorrelation and cross correlation. And you see here these parameters here are well fitted. Most of them just want that we use 10 bins so that we have more information. However, the, uh, the lensing much more important is to consider cross correlations, whether with five or 10 bins doesn't matter too much. So taking into account this cross correlation of different redshift bins is a very good method to measure this lensing term. We can measure it with an accuracy of a few percent as we can measure other parameters. There is more to this, actually, if we neglect this lensing term, we will make a huge mistake. Here we did an MCMC analysis where we um, generated the data with lensing and uh, analyzed it in red with lensing, in blue without lensing, and in gray we said, okay, if we neglect lensing, Maybe in the autocorrelations only, it's okay, because in the autocorrelations, lensing is a small effect. 
But you see what we find, for example, let's just concentrate on one uh, parameter here, the neutrino mass. If we analyze it with lensing, we get a neutrino mass of 0 0.06 electron volt, which is the one which we put in. Can, can I, yeah, can I ask a question? Please. I'm a bit confused now with what is meant by lensing here. So, because you were talking about galaxy surveys and the lensing effect on galaxy surveys. Absolutely. But now you talk about photometric Euclid. So I was wondering, is yeah. the shear included? No, no shear measurements. The, the, the reason um, I'm using the photometric uh, survey is, is twofold. First of all, lensing is more important in the photometric survey than in the spectroscopic because you average over a larger redshift bin, so density fluctuations, the small scale fluctuations are averaged out. And so uh, the lensing becomes more relevant. Furthermore, um, you, uh, the lens, uh, in in the in the photometric survey, you have about ten to the nine galaxies, so shot noise is much less relevant. So actually, what we found also in an analysis with uh, Francesca is that if you analyze LSST, which is purely photometric, you can actually get cosmological parameters. If you do the full analysis, including lensing and everything, you can get a precision which is comparable to what one will be able to do with SKA2. Not now intensity mapping, but number counts, which is very, very futuristic, right? Which we don't know whether it's ever going to happen. Please. No, I'm saying in the future, uh, so it's true, people have not taken it into account so far. Yes, I agree. But that uh, all the estimates are wrong is not true until now, because most of the estimates which have been done so far, uh, lensing was not really relevant. So um, it would have, it, we, we studied it in this, I will actually come to that which is a photometric survey in spectroscopic surveys, as long as you do not cross correlate different redshift pins, it's not important. You can, you may neglect it. But in uh, photometric surveys, where the redshift resolution is less uh, precise, uh, lensing and, uh, uh, sorry, density and redshift space distortions give you a smaller effect because you average over small scale power. And there, the lensing can become relevant also in the autocorrelations. So, uh, yeah, here, if you would, this is done for Euclid. So if we would analyze Euclid without lensing, photometric survey, not shear, but just the galaxy number counts, we would infer a neutrino mass of 0.3 electron volt if it is 0 0.06 electron volts. Because lensing and neutrinos have similar effects, they damp small scale structure. <clears throat> so let's let us come to one uh, interesting variable, which has been uh, statistics, which has been proposed to test GR. In GR, the, the in general relativity, in principle, you have two gravitational potentials, which are called the baryon potentials, and if the universe is dominated by matter and lambda, these two Bardeen potentials are virtually equal. However, the uh, photons only see the sum of the two, while ordinary non-relativistic pa particles are accelerated only by the time time component of the metric. So they only see one of the two. And now, if you compare velocity and uh, uh, and uh, uh, lensing terms, you can actually measure the this kind of ratio. Which in if if uh, if we have GR in a lambda CDM or open universe or something like that, is independent of both bias and of scale and just a function of redshift which we can calculate within linear perturbation theory. This is just given by 
the matter density to some strange power. That's an approximation. Now, Tang et al. have shown that this can also be uh, converted to L space. No, that's Tang et al., that's Pullen et al. who showed that this can be converted into L space. And then we have pointed out in L space, we cannot really measure kappa delta and delta delta, but we measure galaxy number counts. So there are correction terms, uh, corrections to these, which have to be taken into account. They are uh, written down here, but these corrections actually can be measured and can be subtracted. And that's what we have done uh, in uh, for for the de for the desk like survey, and there we have found that these corrections due to lensing are on the level of at best two to four percent, where these EG statistics has been measured with a precision of 20, 30 percent. So, okay, not relevant. However, for Euclid, if you look at at high redshift for Euclid, this can be up to 40 percent if you correct for it you find this scale independent, only redshift dependent result if lambda CDM is the correct underlying theory. But if you don't correct for it, you, you think you have found deviations from GR, whereas actually you just have neglected contributions. What is also interesting is if one looks at intensity mapping, all these lensing terms, these first order lensing terms actually drop and then you can use these EG statistics much more easily. Let's just say a few words also about the growth rate. The growth rate of perturbations is very sensitive to the theory of gravity. And so uh, one of the big goals of spectroscopic surveys is to measure this growth rate, how, how fast perturbations grow. And this can be done mainly by using redshift space distortions. Therefore, we have to have precise redshift measurements to measure these redshift space distortions precisely. And even though lensing convergence is actually not so relevant for, for spectroscopic surveys, since this growth rate is, so sens is such a sensitive uh, thing it is, it does affect it. Here, this is a study which we made with Francesca and uh, Goran uh, Jelek Zitzmek, uh, PhD student in Geneva, where we have studied how much is it affected, this growth rate, if we neglect lensing. And we have seen that, that it is affected by uh, by a, a percentage which is larger then the error in the data. That's the second graph here. Depending on the configuration or so, it can be a bit more or a bit less. So if we don't include lensing, then we will infer the wrong rate, growth rate. That's the conclusion of this. And similar results we are now studying hold also for Euclid. This study here was for uh, LSST, SK2, sorry but for the galaxy number counts, not the intensity mapping. Okay, this is more or less all I wanted to tell. Maybe just take home message. In cosmology, what we truly measure are angles and redshifts. So whenever we say we have measured a power spectrum and we show you a power spectrum from a measurement, there is always model dependence in the power spectrum because it infers from redshifts a length scale, and that's model dependent. And this, to some extent, complicates parameter estimation. One has to think more. It's not impossible to do, but it's more complicated. I mean, there have been ways to define a power spectrum, including lensing. For example, Jayul has developed something like that, then also Castorino and Didio have developed such a power spectrum. It can be done, but it's quite complicated. And its relation to what is observed is more complicated than for this angular power spectrum, which comes directly from the observations. So for the future large and precise 3D catalogs, especially the 
photometric ones, I think it will be much more useful to measure, to work directly with correlation functions and their, their harmonic transforms, the CLs or three point functions and so uh, in angular and redshift space without doing any analysis, uh, any conversion into an unknown, uh, which is model dependent. Of course, these quantities are more noisy, they depend on more variables, but they also contain more information. They actually are sensitive not only to the matter distribution, which gives you the density fluctuations, and to the velocity, which uh, via the redshift space distortions, but as I explained to you, also to lensing, so also to the gravitational potential. So this means in principle, we can determine on the one hand, the matter distribution, and on the other hand, the geometry by just using, uh, looking at number counts. So this means we can use them to test Einstein's equation. And as I showed you, especially looking at the correlation between lensing and uh, a convergence and number counts, we can um, we can make a, a quite interesting test of GR via the EG statistics, or we can test GR with the growth rate, where it's also important to include lensing. So this angular information, which we directly see in the sky, will be useful and is a new route not only to measure cosmological parameters, which we have done very well with the CMB already, but I think it's more interesting to use it to test general relativity on cosmological scales. Thank you for your attention. Great, thank, thank a lot for the nice presentation. Uh, question. Okay. Uh, since we already talked about shear, I want to ask a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, your goal is to test general relativity on cosmological scales. So isn't shear actually a fairly simple test of that? Yes, shear is also a very simple test. And for example, if uh, this will be something which I didn't talk about in one hour, you cannot talk about everything, is if, if uh, general relativity is correct and the universe is lambda CDM, there is a very simple re relation between kappa and shear. Actually, they have the same power spectrum. So this will be, with the number counts, we can measure kappa, the convergence, which is the diagonal part of the, of the uh, lensing map. And with the shear, we measure the, uh, the, the traceless part, right? And we know they are very simply correlated because they are both derived from, a pot from the lensing potential. So if we compare these two measurements, this will tell us a lot whether there are vector terms in the shear, which we didn't take into account, which would not contribute to the convergence, etc. So this, I think, is another uh, way also I mean, another point is that these kappa measurements here with the number counts has completely different uh, systematics than the shear. I think this is probably the most promising thing. You know, with shear, we always have this problem of intrinsic alignment and stuff, which kappa has also its problems, but it's completely, they are completely different with these number counts. So I think it's always very, very good if you want to measure uh, something in cosmology, you usually want to measure it in more than one way because uh, of systematics. So, but you are, of course, right. Shear will also be very important. So, this is to more on your opinion. In your opinion, do you think that we are the only theory of gravity at cosmology scale, or there is some modification needed because of our tension and other things? I just don't know. I would like to know. I don't know. I mean, yeah. So, 
framework, I mean, we don't really know what governor and what energy actually is. So dark energy could be some kind of a scalar field or whatever. Um, and we are on the scope of the web, right? So this question is, of course, totally justified. And, you know, in principle, let's say um, GR is not correct. I don't have G mu nu equals T mu nu, but I have some other equation. I can always equate G mu nu to something, right, and call that my T mu nu. And... Uh, then I would say, okay, I have a very strange dark energy which has very strange properties. But then, if uh, and uh, but Einstein's equations are correct, right? Or I can say Einstein's equations are not correct. So in that sense, from this purely classical analysis, you can always uh, put uh, call the right hand uh, the call the right hand side of the of Einstein's equation your energy momentum tensor. But there are things which we don't expect from an energy momentum tensor, right? We don't expect phantom behavior, et cetera, et cetera. Energy momentum tensors should satisfy certain energy conditions or so. Then one would have to go there, I think. I don't, you know, if, we, if dark energy is what we think it is, something either a cosmological constant, that's the worst case, or some very, very slowly varying scalar field, it's very, it's nearly a matter of taste with what you want, whether you want to call this a modification of GR or just dark energy. It's not clear cut. So the question is very justified. Yes. Yeah. Um, if we write down some metric with the uh, uh, phi and psi difference, right? Mm -hmm. difference. Uh, and then we work out work out the Ricci vector, right? And equ and say and equate it and, and say okay, what right answer is it? And then we try to interpret it to be given like that to imply T V. Is there some generic behavior which one tends to get? Like does it generically produce phantoms? It will still have zero divergence. Um, yes, um, it's it's quite often that it produces phantoms. Or let's put it also that way: if we on large scales, if you have linear perturbation theory, there are there is nearly nothing which has anisotropic stress at the linear level. So if phi is not equal to psi, then modification of GR is a good bet. Of course, in all my analysis here, also in these number counts, the assumption was that we have a metric theory, so that, that, that photons move along geodesics, that dark matter moves along geodesics. If that's not true, then we open a Pandora's box. I don't know what to say anymore. But if we assume that, then uh, there are possibilities, like, for example, topological defects, that, which would give you phi not equal to psi, or some very strange fluid which has anisotropic stresses. But most things give you that only at second order. Topological effects are nonlinear structures, as you know. So there you have it. But if phi is not equal to psi, that would be, I think, a very, very interesting discovery if we would see that. Sorry, you have one? I would also have one or two, but yeah, okay, so it's a very uh, maybe naive and general one. Uh, oh. Actually, I forget. <laughs> very good. Uh, no, if you would include, for example, vector perturbations, then you break it. You know, vector contribution uh, yeah. perturbations, they contribute to the shear, but not to the convergence. So, yeah. 
Yes, yes, which you don't expect. It would be strange, it's true, but it's not impossible. Let's say there are uh, magnetic fields which which are large, which are nano gauss. It's not ex excluded. Could be. Thank you. So, uh, just a little bit of technical question. Uh, so, about the neutrino mass, it is very striking that uh, if we don't include this landing analysis, then we get a very different yes. stigma. Area. Yes, yes. What are the uh, specifications you're looking for? The that was not a fission matrix, that was an MCMC. So, uh, there we let me give uh, yeah, that, that's the oops, that's sorry, that's the plot. So, this is an MCMC analysis. So, you see actually the curves are, uh, the, are not really Gaussian, and the input neutrino mass was, as I said, 0 0.06. And what you then find with your MCMC at one and two sigma, you see it with this, with this blue and, uh, uh, and gray curves are really, as you said, like five sigma off. Yeah. But this is the angular power spectrum uh, compared with specifications of the, phot uh, of the Euclid photometric survey. And the and uh, the priors which we used here were very large flat priors. We also redid the analysis by using um, values, the values from the from the Planck survey with three sigma error bars, and the conclusions are the same. They don't really vary. You see one. One interesting point is also, of course, with these photometric surveys, which contains nearly no redshift space distortions, you cannot determine the bias if you don't have lensing. You also see this here, right? If you don't have lensing, you don't know what the bias is. You need the lensing to break the degeneracy between matter fluctuation and galaxy fluctuations. One final question, um, like first and foremost, you maybe from your side. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's say um, with like the next uh, experiments, we will um, find like conclusive deviation from lambda TDF if we cannot uh, like go down. Yeah. Let's say lambda TDF just breaks. Um, are we going to convince people that like whatever we found uh, is is like the new standard model or or do we need like something else in cosmology to confirm that to make people believe it or mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if we find deviations from lambda CDM, this does, uh, doesn't mean that we already have the new model, right? That we have some physic physical model which makes sense or some physical yeah some theory which makes sense and explains the data i think if we have that and if it's really a sensible theory people will believe it but i think in cosmology we always need more than one observation which gives you the same thing if you only have the number counts that's probably not enough we need like shear or some other observations as well i have one follow-up um, what if we don't find anything and it's lambda CDM all the way through and we have minus one and zero for the W parameter? Do we have, to, can we accept an arbitrary value of lambda in the equation? I don't think so. No? I don't think so. I think lambda CDM, of course, I don't know whether we find any deviations, but lambda is just too strange. At least. I mean, uh, how can we have, how can we have, you know, there is no way to di distinguish between a cosmological constant and vacuum energy with any experiment. Experimentally, they are identical. We learned from Einstein that two things which are experimentally, where each experiment gives you the same result, you shouldn't distinguish them as two things. They, they are only one and the same thing. So let's talk vacuum energy. How can vacuum energy be 10 to the minus three electron volt to the fourth power? 
it has no uh, i mean we would need some uh, some theory which would explain something like that what's what's that scale I mean, it cannot be varying as the universe expands, right? Somebody, there, there, there are sometimes papers which say, okay, there is a cutoff always at the Hubble scale. So the uh, vacuum energy is always given by the Hubble scale. But no, if it would be that, it would be changing with time and it would have completely different phenomenology than what we see it as. It always was as small as it is now. At least that's in our models, and that's what fits the data. If we make it always given by the Hubble scale, we can't fit the data at all. So the I don't know how to understand this. I think it's really this problem with the vacuum energy was pointed out, I think, for the first time actually by Pauli, who said uh if the vacuum energy is determined by the electron mass, then the universe wouldn't even reach out to the moon. And uh, it was Norbert Schramann who redid the calculation and found the universe would be 31. The curvature scale of the universe would be 31 kilometers. So it's truly not out to the moon. <laughs> so we don't understand vacuum energy. I mean, as long as gravity doesn't enter the game, all is fine because only energy differences play a role. And we know that differences of vacuum energy do play a role. Probably we have even measured them gravitationally because they, they uh, enter the lamp shift, right? I'm not sure whether the lamp shift difference in the mass of different elements has been measured by this kind of equivalence principle measurements. I'm not sure whether it's a very, very small contribution. Probably, I don't know at which digit it enters the mass. Of, but anyway, so for me, this is the biggest riddle, this vacuum energy. And if the cosmological constant would be zero, we would all say, okay, fine, we know there must be some quantum gravity effect which tells us that gravitational constant exactly cancels the vacuum energy. That's this, the role of this constant. We have to make it minus the vacuum energy so that this effect is gone. But it seems not to be gone. I don't understand it. So, there are no more questions. Some of your questions? No. No, I remember it now, but I will ask it. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> well, then let's thank uh, Wood again for the nice. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> <laughs>